Hi YouTube! Welcome to another reaction video. This time we're going to react to da -da 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 -da, one of the most requested videos um, by you. The Emperor of Man by Luton. Huge shout out to Luton. Please uh, check out his channel on YouTube if you haven't yet, but you probably know who Luton is. I don't need to tell you, but just in case, if you're just if you're new to Warhammer 40k, if you're getting into it together with me, you're following my journey and uh, just you know coming along with it, and you don't know much about it, I cannot recommend you Luton enough uh, as a source of serious advanced uh 40k lore please check him out he's a friend of mine and of this channel uh we love him very much uh big 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 shout outs big shout outs to luton yeah we watched the first video which was a what the fuck is warhammer 40k it was like an introduction a uh, short 20 minute introduction and this is the first like lore lore video it's a series of videos actually there are more parts to it but we're going to start with part Part one, chapter one. It's not a super new one. It's, I think it's like from three years old. Ooh. Eight years old, you guys. So much has changed since eight years. We're going to watch some grim dark story time. In the grim darkness of the far future. There is only war. Uh, I think I'm going to enable um, close captions. Was a man, a man born in a forgotten time, created by a force of unknown origin. He would cross the ages knowing his one purpose to lead humanity as the greatest empire in the galaxy, the Imperium of Man. In this time, he would be known by only one name, the Emperor of Mankind. Chad. Oh my God, this is like watching a movie or something or a documentary. I love it. Yeah, that's Henry Cavill, right? This is Luton. I must first apologize for the length Luton. of time since the last project. The simplest explanation is it took me a long time to compile amid many other things going on for me. So we now move on from the Eldar history and wade into one of the most important and complicated narratives in the universe of the 41st millennium. It is, of course, the rise of humanity and the Imperium. In the dark, never ceasing war that is the future, humans have risen to control and maintain a galaxy spanning empire whose official title is the Imperium of Mankind. The Imperium is the largest and most powerful political entity in the galaxy. It has been established for a period of some 10,000 years up to its present date in the age of Warhammer 40k. The lore and scripture around this period is massive. Despite this daunting task though, I have decided to interpret it in one piece chronologically, splitting it into chapters so as to best enable you guys to get an understanding and a grasp of what it is all about. This is the third video in my Warhammer 40,000 law series and it seeks to create a foundation for all of the further videos. Oh my god, it's one of Luton's first 40k lore videos? What the hell? This is the third one? This was eight years ago. Like, what? Where were you eight years ago? Were you even born eight years ago? Luton was already making 40k lore videos. What the hell? Does, I love this artwork. I love it. Which talk about the Imperium of Man. <laughs> the Imperium of Man consists of the planets, systems and forces throughout the galaxy which contain Imperial citizens and their derivatives. 
Not all humans are universally members of the Imperium though, and as you would expect there are rogue traders and those who choose to live on the legal fringes of the society. At it. Looking at it. The single most important figure within the Imperium is the aforementioned founder, saviour and ruler of this empire known as the Emperor of Mankind. He formed the Imperium some 10,000 years previous to the current established date in the universe of Warhammer 40,000 at the end of the 30th millennium. This occurred following an especially brutal period of societal disintegration during the last days of the Age of Strife. In this video, I'll outline the political state that is the Imperium, as well as the history behind how humanity reached this point in the far future. Okay. As with anything though, the complexity and depth of the law means I can't cover it in its fleshed entirety, so some tangents are going to have to remain for future videos, but I do my best to cover as much as possible which is relevant. Plus everything that has changed throughout the these eight years. The Emperor sits as an extremely powerful figure within the Imperium. Make no mistake, he is the centre of humanity in the 41st millennium. So powerful a humanoid, he was arguably barely human to begin with, and he continues to protect mankind after his mortal wounding during the final battles of a period known as the Horus Heresy. Were it not for his ever-present psychic voice reaching out, searching, protecting and planning, then the Imperium of Man would undoubtedly fall back into dark oblivion, and perhaps the light would be extinguished permanently. The Emperor was injured so badly after the heresy that he now exists only as a husk of a man within a stasis chamber called the Golden Throne. This allows him to live on eternally as he has done for some past 10,000 years whilst continually guiding mankind through psychic whispers. The only catch with this is thousands of psychers are sacrificed every day using their essence and psychic power to keep him alive as he is heavily oh protected my God. and attended to back on the ancient she homeworld looks terrible. Legend, Terror or Old Earth. What the kind of what kind of a wound was that? They they weren't be able to uh, heal it, but they somehow managed to sustain him, keep him alive for so many years. He looks glorious. This is wild. This is wild. How badly he, he was injured. I've never seen this artwork before, showing him like giving a top down view of him. To, yeah, it's a flesh wound. Literally. <laughs> these these guys kind of look Russian. Man in the wider galaxy now consists of many systems, planets, and trillions or like of citizens. like Slavic, I don't all know. All the while, the Imperial military and the many administrators of mankind, all of whom swear allegiance to the Emperor, all stand together against the nightmares of the galaxy to form what is humanity in the darkest of futures. Oh, about the origins of the Emperor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That supposedly it now is. Now, we know that in this future we have now. access to highly advanced technology and face many voracious enemies wielding our own forces to then counter them. The important question in understanding the Imperium is how did we get to this time? And to understand this, we need to look back at the extensive and dark history of humanity. There is a small clue as to the way in which the people that constitute humanity in the 41st millennium view their past. That is, the Imperial Two-Headed Eagle, the crest of the Imperium. It stands with its two heads, but with one eye closed. Blind, or perhaps refusing to see the past. Mm -hmm. The other eye is open, open. looking to the future. Oh. The logic being that the past of humanity is too painful or dangerous to look back on, so we look forward, striving to be stronger and more powerful as we have done for thousands of years. Wow, I didn't know this about the... Uh, there were distinct um, ages of humanity's Acula. history, Acula? and these tell the story how of how it? we reached the time of the Imperium. One millennium equals 1,000 years. The Imperium has now been established for 10 millennia or 10,000 years. Humanity has existed for roughly 41,000 years. <laughs> this timeline demonstrates the ages of man through this period, from our ancient history through to the age of the Imperium. We have the Ancient History, the Age of Terror, the Golden Age of Technology or the Dark Age of Technology, the Age of Strife, the Unification Wars, the Great Crusade and the Fall of the Eldar, the Horus Heresy and the Great Scouring, followed by the final Age of Imperium of Man. And we are here in this one. We are not Ancient History. We're Age of Terra or Golden Dark Age of Technology. I think we're the Age of Terra currently. I am taking notes. By the final Mental Age notes. of Imperium of Man. Oh, 
he's gonna go over the ancient it. history tells of the dawn of mankind but this period is largely one of animalistic evolution the most significant event occurs around 7000 bc this event marks the birth of the humanoid who would become the emperor of mankind his origins are Ooh. something of a heated debate among the 40k community there are several theories around this and it's important to note that something i rarely see stated on uh, forums or discussions around the origins of the emperor is that quite simply no one knows the origins of the emperor it's all just speculation simply because one theory has had a vague reference at one time or another does not make it gospel in fact so people are saying that in the 10th edition they reveal the origins of the emperor but I don't know this yet because I haven't uh, read or watched or I don't know anything. Or maybe it's just another theory. Maybe it's like not 100 percent. But, you know, you're listening or you're listening to a Twitch streamer who doesn't know shit about Warhammer 40k. So there you have it. <laughs> like, I don't know. Go go do go do your own research. I don't know anything. <laughs> I just listen to people in my YouTube commentary. <laughs> As I've repeated before, the crux of the matter with imperial history and law in general is that very little should ever be considered official or canon. Uh, such is the state of the loss of history, misinformation and suppression of facts within the 40k universe. So essentially, the correct version is the version you want to believe. In a universe where history is stored over thousands of years and in times of unimaginable devastation and strife, it's unlikely something could be considered a cold hard fact, especially when you're talking about events that happened in ancient history in an age where accurate recording of information seems unlikely or even impossible to have survived. The first version of these events is the often widely accepted background which states that in the ancient times some humans carried a natural affinity or awareness of the warp. These were the earliest psychers. psychers mm -hmm. They would be village shamans, shamans. or witch doctors in oh ancient God, yeah. communities. Their premonitions led them to understand that in the future mankind would face the darkest of times. Their decided course of action would be to commit ritual suicide en masse, returning their souls and essence to the warp to then coalesce and be reborn as one supremely powerful psychic being. This being would then spend the future millennia living a Highlander-like existence, transitioning from identity to identity, oh, sometimes wow. taking on famous leaders in history to steer humanity in the right direction. And then upon reaching the age of strife, he would step into the four to become the supreme leader of all humanity what? and Not unite this. us again throughout the galaxy. Now, some people take this as the most canon version of the Emperor's origin. I but like this version. Others, including the one that I actually personally subscribe to. The shaman story is all very well and good, but it leaves me with some questions. For example, if these shaman were some of the earliest humans with only a vague awareness of the warp, how could they have such powerful precognition to foresee the need to create such a super being? In addition to that, if they were truly the earliest stowings of psychers for humanity, then surely they would not have been especially powerful. And even with their powers combined, uh, how could they summon humanity's greatest champion? No, not Captain Planet. So, those two things stand out for me. Also, their plan to commit mass suicide and then hope that they would all be reborn together seems pretty spurious. It seems to tick Space the boxes King. from an okay, I guess that's possible point of view, but it just doesn't make sense beyond that. Another theory is that the Emperor was in fact one of the old ones, who you will remember were one of the most ancient super beings who could- Luton, I heard people are calling you a heretic. <laughs> That's what I heard too. <laughs> yeah, you're just saying. <laughs> created the Eldar, the Orcs, and even humanity. Yes, really. Uh, go and look it up for those naysayers who think that they did not. <laughs> This theory, again, at first is captivating, until you start to think about it more. And then you realise it doesn't really make any sense. The old ones were, as far as we are informed, uh, not shapeshifters, but creatures of light and dark. There was a statement to the fact that just a single old one escaped the brutal genocide of their race, but then was eventually killed at the birth of Slanesh when the Eldar fell. If the Emperor was some other escaped old one, it doesn't make logical sense that they would choose one race and then ultimately lead it. Although I suppose Devil's Advocate, who's to say what would be going in the mind of this old one after his entire race was extinguished, maybe it had a crisis of conscience. Anything, I guess, is possible. 
and then not to mention also the fact that the Emperor would lead humanity to wage war on pretty much every other Such alien race, cool art which wouldn't oh really God. serve any purpose within the context of an old one's mission statement. They were originally life givers. They seeded planets with life to you know, create new races in the universe. And again, unless it had simply lost the, you know, the plot and uh, was operating on his own sort of mission plan. There are some things that do fit this theory though, such as old ones being very powerful psychic creatures, they had extended precognition, they had very extensive almost immortal long life, and they would have the ability to genetically manipulate humans. But all of this seems very soft and is only plausible at best. For me, this theory just doesn't really fit. So the last theory, and the one that I mm. personally believe, is that the Emperor was neither the creation of some bizarre suicide pact or an old one, rather something in between. It's fair to say that in any ancient history nothing is quite as it's written and that some reading between the lines is necessary. The most ancient of history available hints that the last remaining old one floated around the galaxy meddling and dabbling and trying to have some last impact on the worlds which they felt they had failed and left their race completely annihilated. We know that the Old Ones were capable of creating beings of immense psychic power. This is how the ancient Eldar defeated the Necrons and Satan, who were, well, let's not forget, gods capable of devouring stars. So the theory I stand they by made a space is that a baby fragmented emperor? remaining Old One drifted around the galaxy until he was struck by a precognition so terrible that he had no choice but to resolve becoming involved. It and intervene be and... He saw the vision of the Eldar fall or the rise of chaos. Either way, he knew that the Eldar were by now far too arrogant to accept any help and would be of no use, yeah. remembering that the Eldar had turned their backs on the Old Ones long ago. The Orcs, yeah. who were also uh, an Old Ones creation, they were too crass and mindless for such preparation. Instead, he would turn to the weak humans. Weak, but with great potential. And so he would decide on forming a divine creature, a humanoid of the most immense power. To lead but them. birthed in such a way that he would not allow those humans would not immediately view him as a god, but as a man. To be not worshipped, but instill a sense of power, of awe, of destiny. <laughs> there are other clues as well. Apparently, further along in Earth's uh, that's ancient a cool history, a theory too. crashed to Earth, who had an appearance we would describe as a dragon. It would seem, though, that this dragon was in fact a small what? fragment of the star god. 40k Satan, has dragons! Who had been destroyed thousands of light years away by the Necrons. Even a tiny fragment of these most powerful beings would be beyond the means of even the most powerful humans to contain. The future emperor in this time wounded this creature and then apparently took it to Mars. I'm not sure how, um, but there it lay imprisoned within the planet. The final chapter of that story, that's one for another day. Still though, this helps to secure the idea that no mere reincarnation of a few shaman could produce such or, or perform such a task. Powerful could an old task. one? Perhaps. But given the other evidence, I would still discount it. But a perfectly designed humanoid of godlike form created by an old one who would know a most powerful psychic being was needed to counter not just the future darkness of man, but to face again the Satan and the Day of Reckoning when the Necrons would rise again. This seems for me the most logical and plausible of origins. The truth though is that we cannot know- So yeah, as I was saying, if there is more information, because this video was from eight years ago, if there is more information on the origins of the Emperor uh, from the from the new lore, uh, you guys let me know in the YouTube comments when this video comes out. Is this a, the Void Dragon thing? Look at it. Look at it. This is so detailed. This would be a pain in the ass to paint for a newbie like me. <laughs> but it's beautiful. The origin of the Emperor, unless some definitive tome is discovered which provides secure evidence as to such, so we are left to speculate until then. One thing that yeah. is certain though is Games that the Emperor was a wants human us to speculate. and godlike psychic power. Keep speculating. He was within humanity throughout all of history, learning, sometimes guiding, mostly sitting in the shadows until he was needed to take a course of action that would lead us into the Age of the Imperium. The last point worthy of mention is that the Emperor of Man would enforce a strictly secular 
society. In the early days of the Imperium, um, this would then enable humanity would identify with him as a man and not as a god. They wouldn't project any religious connotations onto him. Mm -hmm. Also, because throughout the thousands Yet. of years he spent on Earth, he would see the terrible Yet. devastation and fragmentation organized religion could cause. He believed that humanity <laughs> could only achieve its full potential in a strictly secular state. Oh However, even in the crusading period where the emperor would reunite the irony. lost colonies of oh land, my God, some the people irony. began to spread rumors that he was more than just a powerful man. These beliefs would run so strong, it would even question some Astartes to the faith, such as Battle Captain Nathaniel Garrow, one of my favorite characters in the 40K and one of the few space marines from the Death Guard chapter not to be corrupted by chaos. Some citizens of the Imperium consider the Emperor's stance on faith <laughs> even a test so as to distinguish those who can see the whole of the truth, that he is in fact the one true God of mankind. Yeah, the Emperor sounds like a heretic to me. Mm. We would now reach the time known as the Age of Terror. This was the period on Earth from the 1st to the 15th millennia, that is the first 15,000 years okay. on old Earth. A period of extreme technological expansion, from yeah. a pre-industrial era to that of fusion power and travel beyond our planet and even solar system. Humanity would first colonize new worlds within our system, first on Mars and then the moons of Jupiter, before mankind would start to look at how we could travel wow. beyond. To achieve this next goal, colossal starships were created for humanity to cross humanity. the voids between solar systems and powerful engines at this time these advanced fusion drives enabled very, very fast pretty good. but still sublight travel this meant in order to reach their destination it could take anything as long as 10 generations of human lifespan to reach their destinations Subsequently, trade and aid between human colonies was then extremely This difficult, reminds me of um, them being established almost as interstellar? independent states. Very little. Oh my is god, this is interstellar. This as imperial records are fragmented and limited. The emperor during this time had no reason to interfere and so would continue his own work and research back on earth. Study and the improvement of man all the while remaining in the shadows. During the period between the 1st and 15th millennium, various events of discovery and importance took place that would finally propel us to create our first interstellar confederation in the 15th millennium. One of the most important events of note would be during M4. Humanity would discover the warp and begin to research it. Oh my this God. is specifically relevant as it would have been one of the discoveries that would lead the Emperor to understanding the necessity of him coming into the fore. This was the beginning of the end, probably. The golden dark age of technology, ooh. The AI. The AI. <laughs> First it was golden, then it became As dark we pretty the 15th quick. Millennium, humanity would enter a golden age of technology. This would be the highest point in mankind's technological achievements. It would last mm. for some 10,000 years, and humanity continued its rise in technology, science and power, spreading and colonizing mankind all across the Milky Way galaxy. We could create our first galactic empire, ruled from Earth, the homeworld, and establish massive trade networks that further powered expansion and advancement. This earlier period in the age of technology has a subtitle known as the Stellar Exodus. This marks the time when humanity made its first colonies on other worlds, and also beyond the solar system. These initial colonies were reached using the ships that were still only capable of sublight speeds and were restricted by this, as well as our developing but limited knowledge of building these vast scale ships. When these ships reached their destination though, they would be then slowly deconstructed and their materials used to build the colonies. Oh, Some okay. would become manufacturers capable smart. of producing massive war machines or then back then defensive machines Things such as Imperial Knights and even Titans, which the colonies would use to defend themselves against the dangers of the galaxy. In a comparable way to early colonies on Earth, this meant they had to be self-sufficient and due to the large timescales involved before anyone would likely reach out to them again, they would develop their own cultures and languages largely influenced by the noble families established on these interstellar voyages, as well as this physical is like Dune elements or something. on the new homeworld, the planet's characteristics would also shape the way in which their societies would evolve. 
Now, some 6,000 years later, around the period of millennium 21, mankind now began a process of militarization. It is not known who or for what reason created this process or started it off, but along with our expansion and colonization of planets, we also began to expand and develop our weapons. There were and no forces. Xenos back then. Fragments of what was developed during this age of technology, such as Imperial I mean, Knights, probably Titans, there were. Land Raider designs, and so on, would later be recovered by the Imperium far into the future. The largest proportion, however, would be lost to the tides of time, and we can only imagine or hope to continue recovering these lost and most powerful of technologies in the 41st mm. millennium. Humanity had risen to a period of immense power through our technology, and whilst the Emperor of Man existed, he had not made himself known to mankind. He continued to bide his time, lying in the shadows, studying, planning, observing. The very fact that the Emperor is one of the few who would live through this time and on into the Age of the Imperium, and this would then have far-reaching implications for humanity, as the Emperor would carry his knowledge and strength of this Golden Age into a time when none would recall it, and where it would be of critical importance to our survival. For the Emperor, he would Damn, use this, this knowledge crazy. of the Age of Technology to bring humanity back to a glimmer of what this once This looks been. very technologic. <laughs> <laughs> in the thousands of years where humanity established its first interstellar empire, we would become, as much as the Eldar, supremely dependent on technology. Humankind Those were good times. A of godlike understanding, and this was embraced and practiced by the people of the time. The empire of mankind was seen as a bastion of technological achievement and began to use a new class of humans entitled mm, the Navigators mm -hmm. to expand our reach and use the newly discovered warp to travel beyond the distances of existing star drives and cover vast distances in a short time. A navigator's role is to, as the name suggests, protect and guide a ship through, through the, the tides warp. and dangers of the warp. Eventually, over time, humanity would find the warp had become too turbulent to traverse. But in this time, navigators, uh, they're not strictly psychers as such. They possess a special gene called, unsurprisingly, the navigator gene. But they're mutants. They also possess other abnormal characteristics, including a third eye in the forward head, uh, as well as some more alien appearances, such as no pupils in their human mm. eyes and translucent skin. They well like have longer bodies. Than normal appendages. And, uh, their origin is believed to have not been a natural limbs. development, but to have come about through genetic experimentation and engineering in this period mm. of the age of technology. It was likely that mankind discovered the warp and that it could be utilized for crossings, but that required a safe means to traverse it and looked to create a solution to that problem. Mankind's age of expansion and technological glory across the galaxy would lead to many worlds requiring their own localized defense forces. In this time, humanity's mastery of technology was largely unequaled, and this would be employed in the defense and relative growth of the colonies. One of these defense forces, uh, one of the most powerful of them, would be the Imperial Knights. These were colossal war machines that towered over all they surveyed on the Knights battlefield. Knights are so cool. They were built with the knowledge of the Golden Age of Technology, and these giants survived until the Imperial Age. But they can no essentially no longer be constructed from scratch. It's my and dream to paint a knight. In the Imperium, it is now merely maintained. I really, the really Knights like them. The Knights themselves were operated by nobles from the colony worlds who would be entombed within them. They are sworn to protect their citizens from all Xenos threats and the endless nightmares in the universe. As the knights would advance into the later ages, they continued their noble values and morals. Some of the knights are the most selfless and dedicated forces within the Imperium, as well as being some of the oldest. As with most technology from the Dark or Golden Age technology, the knights are immensely Titans. powerful, allowing them to run and fight as much as a dreadnought would fight, but on a much larger scale. These ancient heroes have fought thousands of battles across millennia and stand ready to defend Imperial citizens and support Astartes anywhere in the galaxy. After the Knights, we have the Titans, and Titans are the epic war machines of the Imperium. A Knight and the smallest Titan can be anything like 9, 10 meters, oh but my the God, big Titans giant. can be anything up to 50 meters. They are gargantuan death machines. <laughs> 
Many people believe that the Mechanicum were originally responsible for creating the Titans. This is not strictly correct. They do construct some Titans, but many they simply maintain. This is because the technology used to create Titans is very, very old. And like many things in the universe of Warhammer 40,000 for the Imperium, a lot they of cannot technology build is them really anymore. maintained because of its complexity. Uh, simpler devices they are cannot recreate constructed, them. but this happens less and less. But the Mechanicum do create some titans for the Imperium. Mm. Originally, the Mechanicus found versions that were completely autonomous, created in the Golden Age of Technology. And the largest titan so far discovered was upon the lost forge world of Charania. It was a completely autonomous war machine and was dubbed the Castigator Class Titan. Its schematic was apparently also contained within a is standard this a, template. Is this a model? No, this. I think this is a 3D model. This is not a model like a mini. This is not a mini. Oh, it looks so cool. Construct on this planet, and it was far superior to any class of Titan utilized by the Adeptus Mechanicus it or any other intelligent race in the galaxy. This is a real miniature. I s this looks so freaking good. This looks so freaking good. I thought it was a digital art or like a 3D model. A mini. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mini. I mean, you know, how else you call it a model? 700 euro mini? One feet tall mini? Oh. Oh my god. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. Okay, I think I'm starting to. I'm starting to see what kind of minis I like. <laughs> I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The knights and titans. I mean, they're they're big. They're difficult to paint. So I need to practice on the small boys first. They, yeah, I like the expensive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I got an expensive taste. <laughs> taste apparently, <laughs> but they look so cool. I can see now why they're why they're expensive because everybody wants them. Like, how many points is one of these? One of these is like a uh, two thousand points immediately. The this smallest was so far 1, the only known points. discovered Castigator class Titan, but it was subsequently destroyed by Imperial Grey Knights. Grey Knights are the secretive and unbreakable order of Astartes warriors dedicated to mm -hmm. the protection of the Imperium from the very darkest foes that humanity faces in the 41st millennium. Now the portion of the STC database containing the data for the manufacture of the Castigator class Titan was also destroyed by the Mechanicus. It possessed AI, which is strictly outlawed and heretical within the Imperium. Secondly, it had somehow long ago been corrupted by living chaos energy, and for this reason it could obviously no longer be supported. Imperial records of this event though note that the cost of life and resources required to destroy this Titan monstrosity was severe. The key point here, though, is that mankind was developing machines oh in the God, golden age of this. technology that would never again like be this Titan. They could be merely copied, or, emulated, or used as a is. template to work from in the future. But our level of knowledge, our rules and guides on what could be created, due in part to events that were yet to come, would very much limit humanity's advancement in as the millennium As a cannon for ahead. a BB. I mentioned a moment ago something called an STC. This denotes a device known as a standard template construct. These are one of the single most valuable objects in the galaxy for the Imperium, and their importance was no less during the Age of Technology. So what is an STC? STC systems were advanced AI computers created during the Golden or Dark Age of Technology, and are said to have contained the sum total of human, scientific and technological knowledge. STCs were created when human interstellar civilization was at its technological peak. peak. Their original purpose was to enable colonists to survive on the new worlds mm -hmm. they arrived upon, as they could not carry securely the mass amount of knowledge and humanity at this mm -hmm. time. And even if they could, they might not have people capable of understanding how to utilize this. The STC solved this problem. It enabled the colonies to access all of humanity's knowledge and display it in a way for them to be able to create anything they needed from the resources available and solve it's any like issue a, that could inter, the internet on the new home world no matter the geography <laughs> the internet with limitations or climate search this would engine. enable them to build anything from a simple las gun to a fortified bunker massive war machines or an atmospheric processor okay okay an internet the sorry an internet 
<laughs> the internet and the geek and the geek from Fallout. Yes. STC systems possess the ability to not just store information, but also to produce new designs to meet changing circumstances. Okay. They are immensely powerful That's sources Chad of GBT. information and power, and consequently the Imperium places a high value on obtaining these lost relics of ancient knowledge. Even though now, after many thousands of years have passed, most of the discovered STCs are damaged to the point they only contain fragments of their former stored information. But Imperial forces will still use any means or resources necessary to obtain an STC once it has been discovered, even if this means the sacrifice of legions of military or civilian Imperial citizens. From the golden age of technology and into the ages to come, these valuable systems will be lost or destroyed, so that now, in the age of the Imperium, they have become beyond rare, almost mm -hmm. just a legend. So the consequent discovery of remnants of any new technology from the Dark Age of Technology puts an STC's value to humanity beyond estimation. The little knowledge that has been recovered from damaged STC units is then utilised, copied and stored by the tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus, okay. who are based deep on the primary forge homeworld of Mars. They believe that STCs are the most holy of artifacts and will seek and protect them. Holier than toasters. Cost. This little divergence is an important one because an STC recovery, no matter its state of repair, still remains as one of the most important objectives for Imperial forces in the 41st millennium. The holy grail of this quest though, although unlikely, would be to recover an intact STC, thereby gifting the Imperium all of the stored knowledge of mankind from the golden age, the of, technology. Golden age of technology. If the Imperium uh -huh. were able to recover an STC of this standard, it would catapult the existing human society into becoming yet again one of the most advanced and significantly, if not the most powerful state in the galaxy. The STC Crusade also explains in part about the state of technology and development of the Imperium in that much of the knowledge regarding tech is replicated or learned rather than invented and created. Mm -hmm. Although new tech does come along, it's not overtly specified why so little resources are put into research now. It could be speculated though, however, that mankind relied so strongly upon the Emperor in the last 10 millennia that now they believe he only he is capable of directing mankind's advancement and they solely focus on maintaining him and maintaining the state of imperial affairs. Okay. Probably, so we return probably. to our story and at this time in the golden age of technology humanity continues to expand across the galaxy. Initially slowly as the gigantic starships we crafted were incapable of using the warp to traverse space and as we learned previous they took generations to reach their destination. They were essentially traveling worlds similar to the Eldar craft world of the 41st millennium. When these ships reached their destination they would slowly be deconstructed and their materials could be used to create massive war machines such as the Imperial Knights and Titans which the colony could use to defend themselves against mm -hmm. the dangers of the galaxy. Dangers such as the Eldar and Orcs who were first discovered in this period oh, okay. as a result of our reaching there out we, the there we have system Zenos. to more regularly explore the galaxy. However, interestingly, during this time, humanity was actually considered more powerful than it is in the 41st millennium. This strength was mainly due to our technology rather than actual physical forces such as Astartes who did not exist in this age. Science was humanity's primary religion and mm -hmm. the society of man perceived itself as having reached a time where no one could be a real challenge to us. To a degree this was actually true, true. so much so that the Xenos races of Eldar and Orc actually signed non-aggression pacts with mankind, which seems bizarre from the Orc point of view, but there we are. The discovery and use of interstellar drives, that is an engine enabling cross warp travel, now powered humanity's expansion and domination of the galaxy forward. A federated Damn. government was formed. Those are such a good times. A strong trade community and most importantly remain unified and powerful throughout our colonies spread across the galaxy, aiding and supporting where necessary with either materials, logistics or military. The exact form and nature of this federation is unknown from this time as so much knowledge and history was lost. lost. 
To speculate though, it seems likely that from the way in which humans would live at this time, the Federation would have focused more on discovery, science and working to better humanity as well as supporting our widespread colonies. As the societies we had seeded across the galaxy grew stronger and more developed, most humans would live long, peaceful lives where menial actions were carried out by automation, leaving people time to indulge in their own lives and dedicate themselves to the glorious expansion no, of mankind. No, it's a good this life. This age of peace bears a stark contrast to the unforgiving brutality of the 41st millennium. How did this... ...where many citizens are now born into lives... Right, how did uh, such a drastic change happen? Like, we were literally at the top and then just... Psh, to this. <laughs> Ay, sad, sad, sad. And whose fault is this? Whose fault is all this? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> this, no, this is men. <laughs> or AI. <laughs> or bald villains. I don't know. Uh, it was Lanesh's fault. The treacherous Xenos. Oh my god that are shorter, work-driven, and even hellish by comparison. Yeah, no Back shit. Back our timeline though, and although navigators have now been discovered and enabled interstellar travel, psychers, that is humans with strong psychic ability, had for the longest time evaded or simply passed undetected. Mm -hmm. It would be in the age of technology where this new class of human would finally be identified. These psychers seemingly largely avoided the demonic possessions which had occurred for the old ones, Orc and Eldar. How were they able to hide it before? Be, but again, you may speculate that the Emperor had a role to play in guiding and shielding humanity through this time. As we know, he had always lain in the shadows, ensuring our safety and creating small influence until he felt it was necessary to come to the fore. Another possible Okay, like he was there and he was like protecting us from the shadows and somehow influencing uh but he, we were not aware of his existence just yet. He was huge. <laughs> how did he how did he how did he manage to uh change his identity and hide for for so many for thousands of years for being such a big boy? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> is that by comparison the orcs and elder with their more advanced psychic powers simply shone brighter as we know shone the demons bright. of the warp are actually Sorry. attracted to psychic power in real space like moths drawn to, to a it lamp. Mm -hmm. and so they appeared amid the depths of the galaxy a brighter beacon for the chaotic creatures to be attracted towards whereas the human psychers were very early in development their powers were less attractive they did not stand out so much these psychic mutations were initially limited to only a few individuals per billion or so humans, but toward the end of the Age of Technology, psychers would appear throughout the colonies more widespread than ever before. And some colonies who were advanced and open-minded, they could see the potential advantages brought by human psychers, and they were protected and allowed to develop and explore their abilities. However, on other, less advanced human colonies, they were often killed and hunted down as the people here feared rather than embraced their divergent powers. Oh, damn. Much of, you know, similar to witch hunt. Damn. Oh, okay, I didn't know this. Yeah, the chaos wasn't as big of a deal. I guess, I guess. It was just, like, what? Uh, the Eldar and... Um, and the orcs, I guess. They haven't said anything about Tyranids just yet. But I don't know. I don't know if, uh, if there were any Tyranids on the on the planets that uh, that the humanity colonized or the the Tyranids came with the warp. They're just like eating some other galaxies, I guess. As I hinted at earlier, one of the reasons during the golden age of technology that humanity was able to not only survive, but stretch itself out to colonize and conquer worlds in the galaxy, not to mention defending itself against aggressive Xenos, would be due to their reliance on AI 
and the machine creations of the time. However, mm -hmm. as nearly all science fiction dictates, these primary sentient machines in the Human Galactic Federation would be known as the Men of Iron, and they would stereotypically turn on their creators and enter us into a cataclysmic war. Men of Iron. An STC containing a template for the Men of Iron Robots. was discovered by Imperial forces on a chaos-controlled world. It became apparent that much as the Castigator class Titan, the men of iron here had also been corrupted by chaos and the AI of these creations was sentient. So we can perhaps speculate that the men of iron initially resented their human creators but combined with this were also corrupted possibly by chaos, which at the time was relatively unknown to mankind, hence the lack of any documentation to support such speculation. It is, however, a possibility and stacks up with what we know of the corruptibility of human AI creations. Also, the intent of the dark forces of chaos to obliterate humanity once it became aware oh, of its existence. Yeah. Regardless of the reason though, this war was one of the greatest disasters to befall humanity and would rage for centuries. <laughs> There's exactly. no cha there's no chaos. Chaos that doesn't exist. Humanity is chaos, right? Chaos is just a made up word. Like, ooh, it's chaos's fault. No bitch, it's your fault. I mean it's our fault. <laughs> I agree. The length of the war is not recorded. The conflict was eventually won by humanity, but at a great cost. The damage caused by this conflict to interstellar human society was hugely destructive. We would lose masses of knowledge and technology, not to mention devastating humanity's economic strength and political unity. The war would begin the series of events that would lead into the collapse of the Federation of Humanity at the oh, end damn. of the Age of Technology. As so often is the case, very little information exists from this time, largely due to the Imperium being so wary of a similar disaster happening again. And this is why, amongst the Imperium of mankind, you'll find only the simplest forms of AI. It is viewed as being exceptionally dangerous technology and is strictly outlawed. A substitute is often to combine... Okay, the warp is the internet. <laughs> the chaos. <laughs> The chaos is AI. The warp is the internet. <laughs> we just, we just made it. We just made it happy. Uh, happy, sorry. We just made it happen. Then we made up fancy, fancy names for it, uh, so that we have something else, somebody else to blame. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Human and machine into mindless drone-like beings known as servitors. Servitors are the Imperium's cybernetic servants, lacking true self-awareness and are created from the bodies of either condemned criminals who are unpleasantly lobotomized this is or rat-grown humanoids this whose bodies and brains are sick. partially replaced with machine systems. As a result of this catastrophic like light bulb conflict the, between the, the men of iron and humanity in the golden age of technology, it is now considered one of the most severe crimes in Imperial Sorry guys, I need to take a look and another look at this. Self-awareness and are created like, look at this artwork. The condemned criminals who are look at this artwork. Bottomized or vat grown humanoids whose bodies and brains are partially replaced with machine systems. Damn, so good. As a result of this catastrophic conflict between the men of iron and humanity in the golden age of technology, it is now considered one of the most severe crimes in Imperial society to develop a self-aware artificially intelligent machine it is just considered too dangerous to even consider around millennium 23 the warp was taking hold of psychers and wreaking havoc on human colonies feudal night worlds were more conservative and less abiding of psychers as we said previously who had hunted them down these would fare better than the others who had adopted them more open-mindedly at the time the knights in their semi-titan armor would battle massive warp entities and serve to protect the planet's human population, abiding to their strict code of feudal discipline and ability. Very often, they would be the bastions that protected mankind's worlds, and their importance cannot be underestimated at this time. As is often the case in history, it is not one, but a series of disasters that leads to total ruination. And this was no exception for the glorious empire humanity had established during the Dark Age of Technology. Whilst it was struggling to recover from a collapse in its unity, as well as destruction of many of its resources and its ability to trade efficiently with other worlds, 
a new disaster would occur. Oh that my would see God. the what end else? of humanity's golden age. <laughs> what and else? Instead, throw us further into near total annihilation. The total race of man will never again reach this golden pinnacle of technological achievement. Rip technology. Rip the achievements. Thousands and thousands of years of work and exploration. The age of strife. Oh my god, let's watch another one. <laughs> let's watch the age of I, I was going to, I was, I was thinking of uh, finishing here. No, 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 one more, yes, one more, one more. As we learned in ancient Eldar lore, it was at this time that the Eldar out in the galaxy would fall into near total destruction. These would be dark days indeed, as the Eldar were almost wiped out in a cataclysmic annihilation as the chaos god Slaanesh was, was born. born into existence from the horrifically depraved Maya that Eldar society Damn, her had Her wings are into. so... So this was a disaster Creepy. for the Eldar, nearly extinguishing their light from the universe completely, but it didn't do humanity any favours either. The near destruction of the Eldar and birth of Slaanesh only came to mark the end of the Age of Strife. What caused it prior to these events was the ever-expanding sea of psychic energy known as the Warp. For many millennia, this had been growing more and more like powerful, black hole fueled by the nightmarish depravity that was Eldar society. Around the end of Millennium 24 and the beginning of 25, mankind was still struggling to recover from the disastrous war against its men of iron and its far-reaching impact on the previously secure and strong human federation. With their galactic unity destroyed, as well as suffering from the inevitable wounds of war, material shortages, mass loss of life and destruction of infrastructure, we would now face a new problem. Warp travel was becoming increasingly difficult. Damn. Warp's instability, caused in part by the Eldar's depraved psychic society, meant that many ships now would become lost and consumed by the warp as they were traveling through. This was not an issue for the Eldar themselves, as they used their webways to travel, which you know were outside of what that warp space. For humanity, though, it would be a severe problem, and its impact would deal the fatal blow to an already fragile empire. Um, I was thinking how like all of the all of the all of these uh, terms, the warp, the you know traveling through it, uh, psychers, navigators. That was so foreign. That was so alien to me when I started playing Rogue Trader for the first time. I was like, I was so lost, and uh, like only now it makes still not perfect sense. Like I still don't know a lot of things, but watching lore videos and like getting into 40k has helped me so much uh, has helped me so much with with understanding rogue trader and what the hell is going on a bunch of people are telling me um you know my my viewers uh, who didn't know anything really about 40k before and as i started uh, learning more about it they kind of went along and now they're interested in 40k as well and some are even um going to try painting miniatures and stuff and th i don't know this is so this is so cool i'm serving as an example for some of you like maybe these people were also intimidated uh with warhammer 40k before and this is the reason why they never got into it and now they they look at me and they see how easy and um how do you say Access accessible? Accessible it is, you know, even for a new person. And I guess this serves as, an, as some sort of an inspiration for them too. I'm a 40k influencer. <laughs> I use psychic powers to like yeah. But you you have no idea how many times people called me a slanishite. The losses and damage caused by the war with the Men of Iron, combined with now being unable to travel across the warp to cross those great distances in the galaxy, would ultimately return humanity to a pre-Dark Age of Technology state, where only sublight travel was possible. This was a disaster. Trade and support could no longer be conducted, as these journeys would now take generations to complete. Humanity was once again isolated as it had been millennia before. The warp storms and the isolation they would create would last for over 5,000 years and their effect on human society across the galaxy was catastrophic. 
Some planets with a significantly advanced human colony would survive into the future if they had the means to defend and support themselves. It's important to understand that when a system is set up with no established backup, its collapse has an immediate and profound impact. This was the case with mankind's trade system. It had grown over time to enable many planets to survive solely on imports from other rich parts of the human federation. Without this infrastructure and no way to gain outside support, disaster was inevitable. Many would turn inwardly to the colony, consuming themselves from the inside out, first with barbaric civil war and later total anarchy, fighting over the scarce resources that remained. Oh, damn. The final phase often led the significantly depleted population into a feudal system of warlords and barbarism. This chaos was repeated across the majority of human worlds in this period, even including Earth. At this time on Earth, large areas across the planet had become massive cities reaching for hundreds of miles and having become adapted to a system where all activities were conducted by machines, Earth also now relied heavily on trade from colonized worlds to support the extremely high population mm -hmm. count. Additionally, much of the planet the population was no count is food production and wild. For millennia, hence the need for colonies and expansion in the first place. With the inability to travel and trade, Earth descended into a similar fate of the less advanced worlds. First panic and general disorder, then food riots, resource hoarding, and finally complete anarchy. A tribal warlord system... We're going back to Middle Ages. ...a few survivors left on Earth, brutal warriors who battled out across the deserts and hives of the remnants of civilization. This whole situation might sound unbelievable that society could collapse so quickly and to such a severe degree, there. but it's worth considering that in this <laughs> time, that. human society had built itself up to be so strong in belief of its own invincibility that they simply did not and could not have anticipated the severity of the warp storms or how they would debilitate the trade and support systems that they had been relying upon. Human history is littered with examples of sheer arrogance outweighing logic and reason, as well as blindly staring down dangerous facts in favour of belief in our own self-importance. The lack of planning when it comes to losing their infrastructure across human systems was an acute example of human arrogance. It would now seem as well that whatever had protected human psychers from demonic possession would now end. It's my speculation that as previously stated, the Emperor was what provided this shielding, even though he was not known to humanity at this time. For he knew the power, importance and value of human psychers in the dark times that would lie ahead. Without this bubble of protection that had invisibly existed prior to this time, humanity's weak psychers would be consumed, possessed and go completely insane, insane. causing chaos among isolated, colonized worlds. This period of complete anarchy would last for some 5,000 years this and during this time artwork. many colonies would forget like their family one. out in the galaxy, as well as losing vast amounts of technology and knowledge. Only fragments of the glory of humanity would remain, preserved on the advanced worlds who were capable to survive this dark time. By the 28th millennium, almost all traces of civilization on Earth were gone. Instead, techno-barbarians battled one another over the scraps of the ancient human race. Mars, however, was one of the few worlds to undergo a yeah, different that, that's process. That's fallout for you. <laughs> After a brief period of anarchy, the tech priests of the cult Mechanicus emerged victorious over the Psyker mutants and then unified their homeworld. The priests visited Earth, but upon seeing its barren destruction, wrote it off as unsalvageable. They used any titans they had to help them in the future reunification of man. They would also be one of the few worlds to reach out and recolonize planets Damn. in this time. Are Using so their knowledge cool. of the warp, they chose moments of calm amid the storms of the time in the warp to travel through and establish new forge worlds. These were replicas of the tech homeworld of Mars and enabled them to continue support and recovery of the technology of man as well as production this of munitions is what Mars looks and like now war machines. With Adeptus Mechanicus. But for humanity, its golden age was over. This dark age of technology had fallen apart catastrophically. Many of the weapons that once served mankind brought us to near destruction and turned lush garden worlds into irradiated deserts. 
mechanical factory worlds into dystopian nightmares, beautifully advanced and artistic colonies turned into barbaric, nightmarish hells devoid of all morality. The age of strife was upon mankind, and only the further darkness of the future lay ahead. Roughly 5,000 years later, around the period of millennium 30 to 31, human society had reached a state of pitiful decay after cannibalizing itself for millennia. The Eldar had also reached the peak of their social decay and so heralded the agonizing birth of the chaos god Slanesh, who would consume the majority of their population in one cataclysmic event like that brought Kirby. Eldar society to the brink of extinction. This horrific event, though, would have a positive outcome for mankind. It consumed all of that stored, turbulent warp energy. So after thousands of years of instability, the warp returned to relative calm. Interstellar communication and travel would once again be possible for the civilization of mankind. Ooh. Okay, so in this chapter, the Emperor, the Emperor of Man appears. <laughs> But we're going to continue that next stream, alright? I prefer to take my lore in, in parts, alright? I want to keep watching. I enjoyed it so much. Like, I'm I'm listening to this, and I feel like I'm listening to a, uh, like a hi historical uh, documentary or something, you know, on human history. And I'm like, like, oh my god, oh no, how did this happen? Like, I really feel sorry. <laughs> for the humanity like this like this actually happened IRL <laughs> thank you for watching with me we're going to continue next stream but if you haven't joined the discord please please do if you're uh, interested in my updates and schedules and all that stuff that's all on discord thank thank you all so much for believing me for supporting for supporting this 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 content creator Thank you so much for watching and a special thanks to our members and Patreon supporters. Bye bye!